Welcome, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It is a beautiful day here at Sunnyside Church. We are celebrating God's goodness, His grace, and His glory, and His love for every single person. And wherever you're watching from, if you're in southern Vancouver, southern Oregon, all the 30-plus locations we have live streaming this, we want to welcome you. We also want to welcome everyone who is here in this room and really excited for today. We are in our second-to-last presentation of The Great Reset. And if you've been coming to any of the meetings, you know, and I, can, I will say that Jesus has been lifted up every single meeting. Last night, we had an altar call. We had people coming forward to be baptized, and it is a wonderful thing to see the Holy Spirit moving and working in the lives of the people. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to ask Pastor John to come up, and we are going to start our Q&A session. Very good. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in. I'm up for it. All right. What questions do we have? I actually don't know how many questions we have. No, but, but <laughs> what questions do oh, we have? Oh, let's do oh, what? Look, here, here's the number. You can text a question to us if you want. Don't ask me how the Trailblazers are going to do, whether they'll make the playoffs. I don't know. Okay. Uh, you, ask me, you can text me a question about the Patriots. I'll tell you later, not now. Bible questions. Uh, it'll always be a positive answer. Uh, Bible questions, we'll do our very best. If we don't know the answer, we'll say, we don't know the answer, but we'll try to find an answer. So let's have a look at question one. There's the number there. By now you know it. If you don't know it, that's yep. on you, not me. Question number one. Yes, sir. I have been reading two words in the Bible over and over, justification and uh, sanctification. All right, good. Can you explain the difference between the two? I can. Justification and pardon are one and the same thing. Justification is when you come to God, confess your sins, forsake your sins, and you are made, declared, made righteous in the sight of God. That's forgiveness. You're washed in the blood of the Lamb. I could throw you out a number of Christian cliches. They're all good. I'm not against them. That's justification. It's, it's when you become just, and it may happen in a moment. At that time, the, the, uh, you are sanctified as well. Sanctification happens, but it, it, it's not a one and done. Sanctification is your growth in grace in Jesus, that process of growth by which you become more and more and more and more like Jesus. Sanctification never ends because you're always going to grow in uh, the character and likeness and image of Jesus. Justification is coming to God and being made just. Sanctification is staying with God and growing in righteousness. That's a short answer. I think it's adequate. Yeah. One thing I do want to throw out there is when you come to Jesus, you receive his righteousness. His righteousness. Billy, yes, let's open a can of worms. Okay. Why not? This is my last day. <laughs> I set some fires, run out of here and say, Billy, put them fires up, would you? <laughs> sure. People say to me, do you have to be perfect in order to go to heaven? What's the answer? You're wrong. See how easy you fell for that? You must be perfect in order to go to heaven. I'll let that hang in the air because now you're feeling nervous. Wow, I thought, did he say, yes, I did. And that goes to show our, 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 our crushing lack of understanding of the gospel. Mm. Now, before you come to Christ, are you perfect or imperfect? Imperfect. Very, very imperfect. I mean, not you. Not you. Sorry. <laughs> Before Billy came to Christ, he was pretty good. Pretty good. No. Me. <laughs> very imperfect. <laughs> now listen, and this is what I want you to hear. I mean, I get you. I understand what you say. And I could have said, you're right. But why would I do that? When you come to Jesus, you give him your what? Don't, come on, come on, come on. Don't be scared now. I, I shocked you. Like, oh, I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> come on, snap out of that. We're all family here. You give him your heart? Good. And what else do you give him? You give him your, you give him your sins. I, I did this in the hope that you'd think it was, oh, sign language. Was, <laughs> you give him your sins. What does he give you? Come on now, come on now, come on now. What does he give you? I'm in a, I'm in a church full of Adventists. They're like, oh, wow, fire out. How does salvation work? I'll, I'll break down the 2,300 days for you. Sure I will, but I don't know salvation. Of course you do. What does he give you? Forgiveness. What else? What's up? Pardon me? 
righteousness. Okay, whose righteousness does he give you, Carol? He gives you Christ's righteousness. Okay, now here's my question. Are you listening, friends? Are you listening? Good, I know you're listening. Thank you. Can you be saved without the righteousness of Jesus? Is, I mean, is it possible? Could you somehow circumvent that? Is there another way, slide under, slide over? No, so you got to have the righteousness of Christ. So we come to Jesus, we give him our hearts, he gives us his righteousness. Carol, what kind of righteousness is it? Is it, is it half-baked? Is it sort of decent? Is it okay? Is it good? It's perfect righteousness. Did you hear me? So you come to Jesus, you offer him your sinful heart, he takes it, and he gives you his perfect righteousness. Don't tell me you don't need to be perfect in order to go to heaven. You must. Now, where does that perfection come from? That's the question. Yep. Where does it come from? It comes from <clears throat> Jesus. Outside of Christ, there's no perfection. <clears throat> you can count your almonds and, and, and wear suspenders and munch garlic and all of the things that some people try to do to, to holify themselves, to make them holy. And I'm not against any of those things. Uh, but your doing doesn't get you across the line. It's receiving Christ. Now, a funny thing happened on the way to the streets of gold. What happens when Jesus comes into your life? What happens to the old fruit and dead leaves on a tree when new life starts to flow through? They drop off. So, so don't give me, I can be just like I am and I wander into my heaven with my selfishness and my anger and man, man, man. No, you won't. But when you take hold of Jesus, like I once grabbed hold of an electric fence at my buddy Robert's farm. <laughs> he grabbed the, the wire. He said, look at that. It's all good. No problem. He grabbed, it. He grabbed a wire that wasn't live. He said, no, you grabbed that one. Like an idiot. And I'll never forget. It felt like a, like a bone popped out of the inside of my wrist. Wow. And a little bit like a camel kicked me. And he laughed and I didn't. When you grab hold of power, it flows through you. So you grab hold of Jesus. You receive his righteousness, his perfect righteousness. It's his, but it's yours. You've appropriated it. You've claimed it by faith. Now, that electricity flows through your life. Does it have an impact? Yes. Does it change you? Yes. Will it transform you? Yes. Now, this is the process of sanctification. Growing more and more and more and more into the, the likeness of Jesus. So don't stop growing and stop looking at the mirror and say to yourself, am I good enough yet? Am I good enough yet? You look at Jesus and you go, thank God he's good enough. I'm hanging on to him. But as you hang on to Jesus, you change, you grow, you grow, you change, you grow more and more and more and more into the likeness of Jesus. And we're not going to get into that dumb theological whatever it is game where we go, well, how good is good enough? No, forget it. You've got Jesus. He's good enough. Hang on and grow. That's Christianity. Love it. Great answer. There it is. All right. Yeah. Question two. I was a, put a little cat among the pigeons there, but <laughs> hopefully we extricated ourselves from that, yeah. Billy. Number two, you mentioned yesterday about jewelry. Do you have any other texts about this? And what about functional things like watches or other similar items? Well, I, we looked at 1 Peter 3, 1 Timothy 2. We didn't look at, but I gave you that. You'll find it in Exodus. You'll find it in Genesis. You, we mentioned Revelation, the, uh, the description given there. Uh, there are other places, but I, I'm, I don't want to text you to death. What's the point? The principle is very clear in the Bible. God's desire is that we don't wear jewelry. Now, you can argue with me if you want. No, you can't because I won't argue with you. But that's the principle in the Bible. I don't believe anybody would say that's quite on exactly the same plane as murder. I don't think we'd put it there. But you know what? Mm. We had a pastor at our local church in Chattanooga. He's now a missionary in Vietnam. And someone said one day, well, is this, not this, but talking about something, is this salvational? And he said, it's all salvational. And boy, he's right. Mm. When it's a matter of your relationship with Jesus, I'm not saying your eternal life depends on having eaten one too many cashews. I don't mean that. But it all feeds your relationship with God, and it's all a measure of your surrender to God, and it's all representative of how completely you wish for the will of God to be done in your life. So anyhow, uh, what about functional things? You need to tell a time uh, wear a watch. I haven't worn a watch since I... Got one of these, and that wasn't even a, an intentional thing. But yeah, watches are functional. You, you need a medical alert bracelet 
It might save your life. If you need one, you've got to wear one. So some things are functional. That's a given. Don't split hairs. Read the verse and ask yourself when you do, read 1 Peter 3. Read 1 Timothy 2. You'll find it there. And when you come across these passages in the Bible, there's one back in Isaiah. Oof, I don't know if I should tell you to read that or not because it's scorching. I mean, it's, it's straight up. You read that and you go, mm. But you read that and then ask yourself, does this apply to me? Or am I the exception to the rule? <laughs> That's the question to ask. That, does God want this for me or just for other people? So read that. You, you pray about it. If this is a growth area for you, and I have no idea whether it is or not, then grow, don't be afraid of growth. Don't be afraid of becoming more and more like Jesus. What we do, we love to hang on to our little, our little glass of wine. Now pour it down the drain, man. You'd be better off without it. Oh, but I'm so attached to it. No, you're not. You're attached to your arm. You're not attached to your to your glass of wine. Oh, I like my this. Oh, come on, man. That's not Christianity. Christianity is what's God's will. I want God's will to be done in my life. You know what the world is waiting for? Not a bunch of legalists, but the world is waiting for a revelation of what God can do in a person's life. The world yeah. is waiting to see surrendered people. So whatever the issue, if God is calling you to surrender, I would recommend that you surrender and let the will of God be done in your life. All right, we got a big day today and a, yeah, lo a long, I mean, a long sermon. Settle in. So, so uh, I'm <laughs> glad I padded pews. So let's, uh, let's speed along. All right, number three, I often notice some church people who can be very friendly, but others who are not very kind, yeah, yeah, which yeah. can be discouraging. Yeah. Can you explain what the fruits of the Spirit are and how they should guide Christian living? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I can explain, and I, I'd love to tell you I'll do it expertly, but I'll do it uh, probably inexpertly. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, you find the, actually the fruit of the Spirit. And it says in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the, oh, the works of the flesh. Hey, let's read the works of the flesh. Adultery, you ought to quit that if you're, if you're doing that. Fornication, same, quit that. That ain't good. Might feel good. I mean, might. But ultimately, you've got to live with that. You've got to live with the, the guilt and the, fact and, the, and the conviction of sin. It's not God's plan. I bet there's someone in the room today practicing fornication. Not right now. <laughs> I don't mean right now. I mean looking around. Who? Where? <laughs> don't look, Martha. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean that. But I'd almost be willing to wager. A crowd this size has to be. Don't. Give it up. Tell that scoundrel or scoundreless. It's over because you're a Christian. What else? Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath. Wrath? That's, that's anger, man. Hmm. Strife, seditions, heresies, uh, and more. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So when the Spirit of God comes into your life, it does a transforming work, and you, and, and you change. Now, listen, we talked about sanctification earlier. Uh, that's the work of a lifetime. doesn't mean that now that you become a Christian, man, you're not a real Christian because you lost your temper. Well, that may be true, but it's probably true that you're still growing. It's a growth area, you know? That's probably the truth of the matter, that you're growing. So grow. And back to the question. I know how you can be a Christian and be unkind. You can be a Christian and have a bad day. I get that. I get that. If you do, then you'll apologize because, I mean, why wouldn't you, right? That's a Christian thing to do. Yeah. So what we want to do, all of us, and for some it's being mean spirit, and for some it's being proud, and for some it's being whatever. Do pray. Pray, God, where can I grow? And here's what I, I've said this already in the Revelation Today, the Great Reset series, but... You ought to be praying for the Holy Spirit to come into your life every day. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think about it. When did you last pray that God would fill you with this Holy Spirit? Just think. Don't say anything out loud. When did you last pray, Lord, give me your Spirit. Fill me with your Spirit. I just know for the majority of people it wasn't this morning. And that's too bad. How, tell me how you intend to get by without being filled with the Spirit of God. What's your plan? What are you sliding by on? Your wits, they're no match for the enemy of souls. Mm. 
and they don't compare to the, to, the, to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Pray every day. Pray every day. If you just pray that prayer, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Life will change. Because if you surrender, God will bring you to those places where, you, where he shows you where to surrender and how to surrender. And the Spirit of God filling your life will, will bring, for example, kindness into your life. So, so pray, pray. Ask that God would change your life and, and fill you with Because this, this is what Christianity is. You can boil it down to so many things, but Christianity is allowing Jesus to have possession of your heart. That's the Christian experience. Are you experiencing that? If you're not, I'm so glad you're here. Now you're made. You're going to grow now. You get, your things are going to take off as you appeal to God every day. Fill me with your spirit. Question four. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth question. There's a sin that just keeps on defeating me. What can I do about that? It's a good question. It's a good question. It's an honest question. Mm -hmm. And so that'll happen. Um, here's what you do. First, you bring it to Jesus, You're to God. You bring it to God. Well, maybe first, you, you recognize this cannot go on. This cannot go on. It could, be, it could be anger. It could be pride. It could be dishonesty. It could be pornography. It could be one of a million things. And you realize, okay, this has got to end. You can't end it. You demonstrated that. But God can. And so you bring it to God and you, you, tell, him, you tell him, this has got to end and I want you to end it. Now, a couple of things you want to do. You, you, you've got to have a robust prayer life. And you want to start claiming the promises of God. If, for example, you have a problem with the words you speak, then you claim Psalm 141 and verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. You start, you start to claim that. That's a prayer, but I'm believing you're answering that prayer. Uh, if it's an honesty thing, you go find Bible verses that deal with that. You bring them to God, and you, you know what you do? You, oh, you, you, you take your Bible. My Bible's down here. I'll grab my Bible. You get your Bible, and you uh, open it up, and it says, uh, it says um, I don't know. It's a good verse dealing with some kind of sin. Can you think of one? Specific, oh no, yeah. So, so let's say it's about, it's about the words you speak. Maybe you're a, a cranky kind of, uh, you know, irascible soul. And you say things you know. You, and you're, uh, so you go to 100, Psalm 141 verse 3. You put your finger on it and you hold it up to God and you say, here, you read what it says. I believe this. I want it done in my life. See that? That's what I want. You got to do it. Now, there's some things that you can do if there's a sin defeating you. Let's say it's, let's say there are things on the computer that you're not looking at. Install some software. Make yourself accountable. Uh, 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 don't ever use private browsing and ask someone in your home or one of your friends to review your browsing history. Yep. Cut the cord. Do without it. Do without it. If that's what it takes. Do without it. You're, you're watching Netflix all night long. What do you need that for? Cancel that particularly if you're watching garbage and it's leading you in the wrong direction. So there are some steps that you can take. Make the decision, find the promises, pray to God, uh, make whatever decisions you can make to, you know, cutting the cord or pouring out the liquor or whatever the case might be. Uh, claim the promises, demand that God do a work in your life. Sometimes you've got to find new friends and, and, and carve out new habit patterns in your mind, but I don't want to get too terribly far into this. And then, don't quit. Don't give up. You know, you're going to say, I will not lose my temper again. Oh, you, but you will. I mean, you will. I don't know anyone who quit their bad temper cold turkey. You know, it, it, I mean, mm. stuff is deeply ingrained. Yeah. So when you lose your cool, you don't go, oh, well, I'll forget it then. I'll just wallow in it like a pig in the mud. No. You, you, you go to God, you go, oh, man, that wasn't great. Let's go again. Don't quit. You know that God has got some things out of your life along the way. So if he could get some things out of your life, he can get whatever it is out of your life. And you remember this. You remember this. Jude verse 24 says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. That's the promise of God. Take that to God. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common or moderate to man. But God is faithful. Wow, if you just had that who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. What a great promise. 
No temptation is so great that it must defeat you. God is always able. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. I'm sure you're as glad as anybody else that I had short answers today. <laughs> Tonight, more short answers. Yeah. Thanks, Billy. Yeah. Last thing I'll mention to you on that is, yeah, you're good. good. Yeah, of course. Um, here at Sunnyside, our staff is very consciously aware of these types of questions and we are all here to help you so if you need a step moving in the right direction where there's something that's caught that's dragging you down and you can't overcome please in private share with us and we will be able to help you get you connected to a group of people that can be that support group that helps you along in the journey of growing in in Christ now fun part is we are going to go do our baptisms so thank you John for those Q and A's appreciate it Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, no. Let's try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. This is a fantastic Sabbath. Amen? What a high Sabbath. And I've heard that maybe the church today is having more baptisms at one time than they have in a very long time. So we are thrilled. And what a blessing that we, from It Is Written, can come and join the church family here in celebrating these folks who are giving their lives to the Lord Jesus, evidence that evangelism still works today. Many people came to the meetings by a flyer or a friend or a Facebook post, and their hearts have been transformed. I'm standing in this room behind me before this baptism, and people are just beaming. They're just thrilled. I mean, there's so much love for Jesus going on in that room. I felt like I was in the clouds of heaven. And so we're just rejoicing with you. And I trust and believe that the church family is going to rally around these precious folks. And these are just the first fruits of many more to come. There are other folks who have said to me already, just this morning, I'm going to be baptized. I, I got a little more studying to do, but I'm looking forward to it. Just last night, a sister coming to the meeting, she's going to be baptized in another church she's been attending but the Lord is just blessing all around. How many of you are thankful for that today? There is cause to rejoice, and the Bible says that all of heaven is rejoicing today. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, with the angels of heaven, they are interested very deeply in what's happening today. We are so thankful for those who are giving their lives to Jesus this morning. I'm here with my dear sister Barbara and she's from the Gold Beach Church. And Gold Beach Church is watching here today. We want to greet you guys online. We're very thankful to have you all joining us. They're going to vote her into membership there. She came down to Sunnyside because her family is here. And I believe that they're here today to witness her baptism. Wherever you are, you can wave to her. There they are. Good to see you guys. Thank you so much for being here. And she's got some friends here. So we're, we're glad you guys are here to join us. And Barbara asked me to say just a, a quick word or two, and she's had a lot, of, a lot of trials in her life, a lot of difficulties, some different things that she's experienced, but she wants everyone here to know that through it all, God has brought her through it, and He is good, and He has transformed her in a way that she couldn't if she hadn't have gone through those things. Not that God caused them or wanted them, but because of a broken world that we live in, she did go through those but God has strengthened her through it, and he's her best friend today. And uh, she's been uh, joining uh, through the live stream throughout the series, and she's looking forward to giving her heart to Jesus today. Amen? I'm looking at for the eternal. The eternal, that's what counts. It's Amen. Not this short life. That's right. It's a short life here, but we have an eternity to gain. And she's just thrilled today to take this step of faith with the Lord. Well, we're going to have the baptism now, and uh, how many of you will just continue to pray for our dear sister? Amen? And just to encourage her and keep her strong. Let's have a little prayer for her. Father in heaven, we pray for Barbara this morning that your hand will just continue to be over her life as it has. She gives herself to you in faith today. She's rejoicing with all of heaven, and we know that as she comes up out of the water today, the words of, of, from heaven will be spoken. This is my daughter 
and whom I'm well pleased. So give her a special portion of your spirit. Continue to help her to grow in you in this most joyous day for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Barbara, because of your faith in Jesus, your love for him, it gives me great joy now to baptize you in the name of the Father, his Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sunnyside Church, some of you may recognize this person sitting next to me. His name is Wes Hamlin. Um, he was actually baptized, I, I read, in Sunnyside in 1989, which is really cool. And so in talking with Wes, he had mentioned to me that while he kind of went away a little, he, in, in through just being with his parents and this series, has decided that it is time for him to recommit his life to Jesus to make Jesus the center of his heart and the king of his life. And I think that is just so amazing because actually this is the first time I've seen Wes without his mask on. So I didn't know what he looked like until now. <laughs> and you're a handsome man. So, <clears throat> but I will just, I just want to, I just want to lift up Jesus in this moment because Wes went away, but he is back and he is home and this church is his home. And we are so grateful for him uh, to, in making this decision. Because of your decision to make Jesus Christ your Savior, that he is the king over your heart and over your entire life, it is my honor and my absolute pleasure to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, this one is a joy for me. Um, Sandy is a, is a true miracle. Um, her life, we sat in the prayer room and had a, a really long discussion with Pastor Wes and what she has been through and for Jesus to overcome in her life is absolutely amazing. And we are just so grateful that she is here. She has decided um, to be baptized today and she just has a phrase that in her testimony uh, that she wants to share with you. I, in my testimony, I say that Jesus is the king of my heart and the lover of my soul because of everything he's done for me. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> I'm going to cry too. <laughs> okay, so um, Sandy's story, if you get a chance at all, she is um, a leader at Celebrate Recovery, which is just amazing. And we hope to empower her in that ministry because she's doing a great job. And we are grateful for her. 
And um, let's let's. And you're gonna plug your mouse. Sandy with an I, Millsap with two L's. I am just so honored to be able to baptize you today because of your decision that Jesus Christ is your savior, he's the king of your heart, and he's the lover of your soul. And it is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Bernard Lorenzo. Um, I met Bernard for the first time last night. Um, he came up at the altar call and decided he wanted to be baptized. Um, absolutely. Um, Bernard, I believe, came with Sandy. Um, they sit together. And um, the one thing that I feel about Bernard when I've seen him is fire. He, this man has passion. I remember after one of John Bradshaw's uh, messages, he said something like, that was dope. <laughs> so, so, yeah. But he has passion, enthusiasm for Christ, and he's making this decision today uh, because he wants Jesus to be the king of his life, and he wants to be a part of a community that, that loves Jesus as well. Bernard Lorenzo, because Jesus is your Lord and Savior, because you want him to rule over your life, because of your faith and your decision, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. church. This is Evangeline Thompson. Um, Evangeline joined our Sabbath school last week, and this woman has wisdom and knowledge of the Bible. <laughs> she brought so much to our Sabbath school, and when I asked Evangeline yesterday why she wanted to be baptized, it's because she had an experience earlier in her childhood that she didn't feel like was the full immersion baptism that, that she has learned about at these meetings. And she has a passion and love for Jesus, and again, fire. I can feel it in her bones. She's, she, in the meeting, she's showing up early and taking notes to talk to Pastor Bradshaw about the questions that she has. And that reminds me a lot of my story, just wanting to know so much information. She is a wonderful woman. She's a lover of Jesus Christ. And we are so grateful to be able to fully immerse her today and baptize her. Because of your decision today to make Jesus the center of your life, king over your entire world, it is my pleasure and my honor to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
This is Ed Rink. Ed has a phenomenal story um, in Vietnam where a ring that he had from his wife saved his life from a bullet. And he said that it was God that saved him that day and he knew that God had a plan in his life because of that moment. And I just want to lift up that just that moment and God does have a plan in your life, Ed. We are so grateful to be able to baptize you today and we love you so much, man. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church family, this is Rebecca McStroth, and she is a wonderful woman. Um, Rebecca has a peaceful presence about her. Anytime I see her or talk with her, I leave that place more peaceful than when I showed up. And that's the fruits of the Spirit. Um, this is someone who's going to bless and already has blessed so many people and has a passion for her family um, and for herself, for Jesus Christ. And we are so grateful and honored to be able to baptize her today. All right, Rebecca, it is my honor and my pleasure to be able to baptize you because of your decision to make Jesus the king of your heart and the savior of your entire life. I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
church family, this is Don Dulio. Don and I met outside uh, when he was here early for a meeting, just ready, raring to go. His, um, his wife is a elder at uh, Tabernacle Church. And there's one thing in talking with Don that he loves, and that is church. He wants to be able to serve. He's passionate about serving and ministering to other people. And because of that, he wants to be baptized so that he can make Jesus known to all those around him and care for the people inside the church. Every single church needs people like Don, and we are grateful to be able to bring him in and baptize him today. Because of your decision, your decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, King of your heart and ruler of your world, it is my honor and my pleasure to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. These two ladies I met for the first time when we showed The Chosen over in the fellowship hall. The first time I met them. And they came every single night that we showed The Chosen. And they've continued to come to all of our events. And they've come faithfully to every single meeting um, that we've had. And I wanted to baptize them together because you can just tell the care that they have for each other. And that is just going to expound to everyone that they meet not only here at Sunnyside and already has. Um, so we have Gloria Burroughs here on my left, and then we have Linda Fleshman here on my right. And I just wanted them to both be here because they came here together, and last night they both came up um, during the altar call as well, and they're both ready to make Jesus their Lord and Savior and recommit um, to Jesus Christ. because you have decided to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, the King of your world. It is my pleasure and my absolute honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
<laughs> Linda, because you have chosen to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, that he fills your heart, your mind, and your soul, it is my absolute pleasure to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> So we had 11 people decide to be baptized today, making a decision for themselves to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. And there are people out here that may be right on the fence, that maybe just need that little step and encouragement to see that all these people made that decision. And if you want to be in that journey, making steps towards your Christ being your Lord and Savior, please reach out to me reach out to anyone on our staff, and we would be happy to include you and um, to walk you on those steps. Amen. near and dear to our hearts and that's because it really encapsulates the gentleness and the kindness with which Christ deals with us it's it's an intimate relationship he knows that we're human he knows that we fall and he walks that journey with us
Well, thank you, friends. That was outstanding. That was a song originally written in a cold and dreary basement that didn't even have a view of the outside world. I written in 1912. That, sa- that didn't sound that way. We got, a view of the, we got a view of the garden. Thank you so much. What a beautiful song. As you came in this morning, we hope you received a couple of things, and I'll tell you what they are. We hope you got our Impressions magazine from It Is Written, because we'd like you to know a little bit about what It Is Written is about. I'll tell you this. It Is Written is a ministry of the North American Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's a self-funding ministry. So while the division provides about a 2% of our annual budget, uh, they, they don't fund us. We're grateful for the support of the division. We love to be part of the mission of the North American Church. But we're a self-funding ministry. That's where people like you help we come to Portland every year. We hold a partnership event, although next year we're going to be up at Skamania Lodge. I think that's near Stevenson, isn't it? Hey, Stevenson, you're with us today. So we'll be coming to see you. That's in um, November. We're back in November. Please, if you can provide some good weather for us, we'd like that. So we'll let you know about partnership. You can find out about the partnership events. They're not just here. We have them in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, twice Gettysburg, Orlando, Rancho Mirage, that's Palm Springs, Um, Monterey, California. They're great. They're just great, great, great events. And we had hopes that you would take home with you an It Is Written calendar today. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, these guys are in Tennessee. We're here in Oregon. How can a calendar printed in Tennessee work here in Oregon? They work in any time zone, any time zone. If you were to go on vacation to Hawaii and take your calendar with you, it'll work in Hawaii. Anywhere you go, automatically adjusts for daylight savings time. So we put a lot of thought into this calendar. The, the pictures are photographs, actual photographs taken by friends of the ministry of it is written, and they are beautiful. It's March this month. Oh, that's the delicate arch at Arches National Park taken by... My friend Tobin Kearns, March is, uh, I was taken by one of our own staff members, Jeremy Benson, uh, who loves hiking, and he's, anyway, look for yourself. Very nice. We hope you will appreciate that. We hope you will pray for us at It Is Written. We are in our 66th year of ministry now, I believe, and we're excited by what God is doing. We love to share Jesus. We love to preach the Word of God and produce television programs that share Christ. If you didn't know, It Is Written has, we have our own channel. You'll find it, It Is Written TV, online at itiswritten.tv. Uh, you can link to it through our website, but that's the TV website. You'll find us on Roku, uh, on, on the World Wide Web. You'll find us on smart TVs. We're talking about some other distribution uh, uh, outlets. So we'd love you to join us. In addition to our 66-year-old weekly It Is Written program, we have an interview program called Conversations, preaching program called In the Word, Bible Q&A program called Line Upon Line, Sabbath School program. It's the only one in the world like it where we interview the author of the Sabbath School lesson. So you hear it straight from the horse's mouth rather than through somebody trying to tell you what the author had in mind. So it's a good program hosted by Eric Flickinger, who this morning is at the Vancouver Church. My friend Doug Naa, who, can, who holds, leads our SALT evangelism training program. He's in Salem while we meet here. And we are here. Hasn't today been a fun day already? Come on, say amen like you mean it. Yeah, amen. What a blessing. I told Billy, and Billy, I meant what I said. Hey, you know those people who said, why fool with having meetings like that? You know what to tell them now. You know what to tell them now. Now, you'll be more charitable than I would. But tell them, why do we do that? Don't be a moron. Of course, why do we, why do we lift up Jesus? You're not asking that question, are you? Why do we preach the word? What? You're asking that question? You see the look on the people on people's faces when they came out of the water this morning? Did, did you have your eyes open? Now, our question, ladies and gentlemen, is when do we do this again? What do we build on this? What do we take the energy and, and just blow it up? When do we really get involved and reach our community and share Jesus so this can be done again and again and again? 
bigger. When? There's nothing stopping us but our willingness to do so. So thank God for what God is in the process of doing in our lives. We've got to pray and dive on. Come away from the Bible together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, oh, in Jesus' name we come to you, and we come to you grateful. We are happy that we can open the Bible today and share Jesus. I pray that he would be seen, not some speaker person, but Jesus would be seen. Take us on a journey together, Lord, and speak to our hearts. I pray, we pray, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're joining us from afar, I think we've welcomed you, but welcome again. We love the fact that you're with us. I mentioned Stevenson earlier, so g'day, Stevenson. And, and uh, uh, Canyonville, down s- south of us, and the other villes, the other towns, wherever you're joining us from. Gold Beach, we mentioned you earlier. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here. A 17th century philosopher once said these wise words. Look at what he said. God denied to men the faculty of flight so that they might lead a quiet and tranquil life. For if they knew how to fly, they would always be in perpetual danger. Seems like a little uh, redundancy there, always perpetual. But nevertheless, that's what a gentleman named Lobkowitz said many years ago. He felt like in God's eyes, it would be better for us if we didn't fly. But that hasn't stopped people from working away at it. It's thought that Leonardo da Vinci designed what has been called an ornithopter a machine that he figured would enable people to fly. It had flapping wings. It resembled the anatomy of birds. The man who painted the Mona Lisa, not on canvas, but on a poplar plank. The man who created that magnificent work of art, a fresco, really, The Last Supper. It's it's fantastic. That man really was a student of flight. He never flew, but he was a student of, of of that discipline, a student of flying. People been at this for a long time. What da Vinci couldn't do, a couple of bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio did. The Wright brothers, they owned a bicycle shop. They sold bicycles. They repaired bicycles, uh, manufactured bicycles. December 17, 1903, at Kill Devil Hills on the Outer Banks of North Carolina near Kitty Hawk, they became the first people in the history of the world. I'll get back to that. It is thought, it is, it is claimed that they became the first people in the history of the world ever to, to successfully fly a, a heavier-than-air aircraft. Now, you come to church to learn. Let me learn you something. It is believed by me and others and others that a fellow named Richard Pierce actually got off the ground before the Wright brothers. But Richard Pierce did this in the days before social media, the internet, the telephone. He did it down there at the near the bottom of the world in beautiful New Zealand. South Island of New Zealand, the one that is noted there as the North Island. It's a fact. It's as sure as well. Some people claim, I think it's a fact. I mean, I'm from New Zealand, so what do you expect me to say? You might accuse me of bias, and if you did, I would have to say, I'm guilty. But once people got flying, there was no stopping him. Just 24 years after Orville and Wilbur Wright got off the ground in North Carolina, what happened? Charles Lindbergh became the first individual to fly nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I don't know how you fly across the Atlantic Ocean any other way than nonstop. Where would you stop? But Lindbergh didn't stop. It took him about a day, maybe longer. He flew from New York City to Paris, France. Took him 33 and a half hours. And then just five years later, Amelia Earhart became the first woman to cross the Atlantic Ocean solo. Jets began flying in 1939. Chuck Yeager went faster than the speed of sound in 1947. Yuri Gagarin orbited the earth in 1961. And then John Glenn did in 1962. He did it three times. Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, 1969, 20th day of July. He took one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. And now the space shuttle goes up. Well, it doesn't anymore. That's old hat. Can you imagine? The space shuttle used to go up and come back down. John Glenn went back to space at the age of 77 in 1998. 
in one of those space shuttles. I mean, what an amazing thing. Now there's space tourism. William Shatner from Star Trek recently boldly went where, well, where plenty of people had gone before. Bless his heart. Now they send up rockets that go up and come back down. Land, reuse them. They're talking about sending people to Mars, have been for some time, but it sounds like there's a little seriousness about that now. The question is, how far is this thing going to go? Well, I will tell you, a whole lot further than that, the best is yet to come. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If that were not the case, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Come on and say amen. Amen. One day. Sorry, Wilbur and Orville, no disrespect. One day. Sorry, Neil Armstrong. One day. Sorry, Elon Musk. One day we're going up, all the way up. We are going to travel through the cosmos, through the starry heavens. We're going all the way to heaven. Amen. I've never been there. Leonardo da Vinci never went there. The Hubble telescope has not ever sent back pictures of or from heaven. But millions and millions of people believe that there is a heaven. We've never been. We've never seen photographs. All we have is the word of others who have either seen or been. One of those people being Jesus. There's only ink on paper. We don't have a webcam from heaven. Nothing. So we're taking this by faith. But man, we can take it by faith. Jesus said in John 6 and verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from where? Come on. Heaven. That's right. John the Baptist was convinced. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used the word heaven no less than 18 times. He was adamant about this. In uh, Matthew 10 and verse 32, he referred to my Father who is in heaven. Mark 1 verse 11, a voice came from heaven heaven. By the way, this happened at the baptism of Jesus. If you listened carefully during the baptisms, you would have heard God say, this is my beloved daughter. This is my beloved son. Angels reported that there's a heaven. Chapter 1, verse 11 of the book of Acts, men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? I don't need to read the rest of the verse, but it's so good, I'm going to. This same Jesus, who tell me all right, all right, I'll tell you, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. There are 27 books in the New Testament. 20 of them mention heaven. Revelation talks about heaven more than 50 times. If there was no heaven, imagine the implications. John Lennon wrote the song, Imagine, Imagine There's No Heaven. He didn't know what he was talking about, of course, but imagine if there wasn't. Can you imagine? Earth would be all you have. I, I, I made a few people nervous the other day when I mentioned that the, the average life expectancy in this country is 79. Now, good news is for Seventh-day Adventists, you are expected to live on average about seven or eight years longer, but then there are some people who blow right by that. I have a friend whose father, an artist, a painter, still painting, he's active and, and raring to go every day at the age of 105. So I'm not trying to bother anybody. But if you imagine there's no heaven, then you have to content yourself with nothing more than your time on this mortal coil. Live, enjoy, or not, and then you're gone. Imagine that. But imagine if there is a heaven. Now we are talking. It means that there is something after this life. Something after this world. Remember Jesus said, in my father's house. He began that speech with the words, let not your heart be troubled. Ah, now let's think about that. Why would he say that? Let not your heart be troubled. He knew that his disciples would encounter difficulty. By the way, they were attached to a man who was an outcast. They had left their jobs to follow him. They met constant opposition. They were reviled. I mean, they followed Jesus, but it did not mean that their life was all roses. There were 
plenty of thorns. And so Jesus spoke to them and he said, let not your heart be troubled. He knew their lives would become considerably more difficult. Some of them would lose their lives. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Listen, friend, I know, you know, God knows that there are difficult times in your life. Might be now. Might have been a diagnosis. Might be some friction in a relationship, even a marriage. Uh, Could be some some health worries. You haven't been diagnosed, but uh, you're a little worried. Could be finances. It could be that your hold on God is just... It's like you're hanging on to a slippery pole. For some reason, it's like there's no traction. You're concerned that it might just be slipping away. Ah, wait. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Thank the Lord we're coming through this pandemic. I'm not trying to count chickens before they're hatched. Thank God uh, new COVID cases in Multnomah County, the numbers are in free fall. Thank God for that. Wouldn't it be great if we can put this behind us? You've been badly affected by the pandemic. God says, let not your heart be troubled. Job loss, let not your heart. doesn't mean to, to, to be silly about the reality of the challenges that you face. Life can be challenging. Jesus isn't saying act like you don't have a brain, but he's saying don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be moved, shaken away from where you need to be. Don't lose confidence. Don't lose faith. Don't start believing that there isn't a tomorrow when there is a bright tomorrow, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. He was giving us assurance like when he spoke to the disciples and he said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank the Lord for that. This same Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. No, he said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. The famous, it's, it's, they call it the new John 3.16, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, where God said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. But I'd ask somebody, what's the context of those words being uttered? Who said that? God. Why? When? When did he say that? He said that to his people Israel as they were going into captivity. They were going to Babylon. They were being taken to Babylon. Some of them maybe already have been in Babylon. And God was saying, no, no, no. It's, it's, listen, big picture. It's all right. I know the thoughts I have towards you. I, I have for you a future and a hope. I want to give you an expected end. God says, we are not done yet. The best is ahead. And by the way, between here and the best is a time of trouble coming such as never was. So if you are in the habit of letting your heart be troubled, you're just going to be bumped right out of the arms of Jesus. If you can learn faith and rest and repose and trust and confidence, even when the sea is stormy and the wind is blowing your vessel and the water is getting in the boat and sinking seems imminent, if you can trust then... You've got your hands on Jesus or in Jesus' hands. The best is ahead. Heaven is ahead. One day we're getting out of here and we are going to the place that we can really call home. This earth is not our home. Heaven is our home. Well, does this really work? Does it it, it really work? These Christians, maybe they're just deluded. Is it real? Is it really real? Karl Marx socialist revolutionary maybe maybe was he was he right when he spoke of religion saying religion is the opium of the people marx was saying that faith in god might only provide or he said would only provide an illusory happiness he believed that faith in god was harmful now i would love to be able to tell karl marx this myself but i'm unable to because he sleeps right now Highgate Cemetery in North London in England. I've, I've, I've been to his final resting place. Friend and I, we wandered over to Highgate, took a look around. It was closed. I jumped the fence so I could sneak in there and have a look at Karl Marx's tomb. And as I did, as I did some security guy stepped out into the open and I, I hightailed it out of there. So we know where Karl Marx is. He's dead. He died at the age of 64. He said religion is the opium of the people. Now, Karl Marx is dead, but God is very much alive. Karl, if you could take some of that opium, you would, wouldn't you? You would. Ah, don't bother with Christianity, says a dead man who did not live a long life. It was probably pretty good for that era. God had the final say. 
I emailed a friend who was battling cancer. Hey, how you doing? Man, it was really interesting. He said, he wrote in reply, there are few things in this world you can really count on. That's what he said. He said, one of them is faith in God, and the other is that Jesus died to save sinners. Oh, come on. Now, I know that you just let that by. I know what happens in sermons. You can tune out. You can tune out. But I'm talking about somebody with cancer looking death in the face and able to say, I can count on what? Faith in God and that Jesus died to save sinners. It's like the lady I visited. And uh, and I said, so how's it going? She said, Pastor, I always tried to get cancer in a part of my body where I had two of something. She said, I lost a kidney. I lost a breast. I lost an eye. She said, but I've only got one liver. I said, liver cancer. She said, yeah. How's it looking? Not good. I said, how are you going to be? She said, she propped herself up in her bed, and she said, me and Jesus are going to get through this together. Oh, come on. And that's exactly what happened. She died. I spoke at a funeral. Well, one day soon, she's going to open her eyes and come out to grave. She's going to say, it was worth it. It's all right. We got through it together, and she will forever be in a land that is fairer than day. Even when life is slipping away, you can say, it's all right. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and he's got me. When we enter the abode of the redeemed, we are not going to think back on our hardships. We just say, hallelujah, God was right, Christ is Lord, it's all right, heaven is cheap enough. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, what we need is help. We are human beings, we're broken, we're all broken. Don't tell me you're not, you are, don't pretend that I'm not, I am. We're all broken, every last one of us. We, we, we read sometimes even about high-profile people who fall. and we, you, you, you know, it's, it's, it's sad. It's, of course it's sad. And we don't, want to, we don't want to give people a free pass for their, their, their error or their stupidity or their lack of judgment or whatever it might have been in a given situation. But I'm way past the point of pointing the finger because I understand that there but for the grace of God go I. But here's the good news. God can save the weak. In fact, he can't save anybody but the weak. There is hope for you if you're faulty because Jesus came into this world not to save the strong, but to save sinners. Paul was praying. He had a burden. He prayed repeatedly that God would remove the thorn in his flesh. God didn't, but God spoke to Paul and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, that's a phenomenal thing. My strength, he went on to say, is made perfect in what? Weakness. God's strength is made perfect in weakness. So if you can learn to bring your weakness to God, then and only then you can begin to experience the strength of God. If you're blustering your way through life, pretending you've got it all together and you want to bring God your strength, think again. Somebody wrote on good authority that Solomon was never so great or so wise as when he said, I am but a little child. I don't know how to go out or to come in. So in order to get to heaven, all you need to be is weak. How about that? Any weak people here today? Oh, probably. Well, definitely. So if you can be weak, you can be saved. That's great news. That means that all of us can look forward to heaven. We're not celebrating our weakness, except that we can say, thank the Lord. If it takes weakness to get to heaven, I've got that in great quantities. God can do something with that. His strength is made perfect in weakness. If you're trying to be good enough to go to heaven, you've got to disabuse yourself of that approach to life. If you're trying to, uh, trying to get to the place where, I think God can save me now. No, no, no. It's like trying to make water go uphill. Here is what God offers us. Follow me now. We're in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. For we have no confidence in the flesh. People in Paul's day wanted to rely on the works of the flesh to, 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 to believe or to merit salvation. The stronger I am, the holier I am, the more publicly uh, a pious I can possibly be, the more saved I'm going to be. But Paul says we just cannot trust in the flesh. No confidence at all. 
Now, he wrote about circumcision in the context here, but we're not just talking about that. Any works of the flesh, we cannot trust in them in order to earn or merit or deserve salvation. We just cannot. So what do we do about this? Paul says in verse 4, Philippians 3 and verse 4, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. I could. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Wow. What makes Paul so high and mighty? Verse 5, he begins to tell us, circumcised the eighth day, right day, of the stock of Israel, right nation, of the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Israel's first king, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. All right. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, and those guys were rigid in the way they kept the law. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he says, blameless, and not too many people can say that. I did it all. If there was a work that needed to be worked, I worked it. If there was a deed that needed to be done, I did it. This was Paul. I had qualifications if that's what you were looking for for heaven. But, he says, none of that was going to help me at all. In fact, the exact opposite was true. Look in verse 7. What things were gain to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Why would they be loss? Verse 8, he tells us. Yes, indeed, or yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as, the King James says, Dung. New King James here is a little more uh, polite company. Rubbish, refuse, that I may gain Christ. Without Jesus, my works are meritless. They're useless. They're unhelpful. They may even be a hindrance because I may rely on them. And then he states his great desire in verse 9. I want to be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You just heard something utterly transformational. If you didn't realize it, pinch yourself, sit up, and go, oh, what, what did I miss? Paul is saying, all my works don't need them. They're dung, they're manure, they're no good. They were worth nothing. But, but what I want is to be found in Christ, in Christ, surrendered to him, not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness of God. And I can have that by faith. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You never deserve it. But you can believe it. And when you do, you say, that's mine. I have God's righteousness. We talked about some of that in question time earlier. Now that I have his righteousness, that's absolute perfect righteousness, and it's mine. And God, when he looks at me, sees that, and I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm growing in the grace of God. I have his righteousness. Amazing to have such incredible righteousness. But that's what God offers us and promises us. It's the only righteousness you can have if you want to get into heaven. Self-righteousness doesn't cut it. How do we have it? Easy. We have it by faith. When God takes your sin, he gives you his righteousness. And you know it by faith. You believe it. Can you believe that? Of course you can believe that. You believed in a tooth fairy once? That wasn't true. You believed in Santa Claus once? Ah, you learned. You believed in a hundred different things. You, you believe this, so many things. And you say, oh, but here's one thing you can believe. That when you claim the righteousness of God, it's yours. And you have it by faith. It's easy to feel like a failure as a Christian. Largely because we have had so much practice at failing. And we continue to stumble, some of us, more than we really need to or should. Professional golfer Bryson DeChambeau was playing in, was it the Wells Fargo? Charlotte, North Carolina. After two holes, he, sorry, two rounds, and that's where they, they, when, the, when the cut is imposed, he looked at his score and he said, I'm never going to make the cut. 65 players would make the cut. He was 90th. He said, I'm 25 out. I'm not going to make the cut. Got in a plane, flew back to Texas. Well, hello. Things changed. His score ended up being pretty solid. So many players shot lesser rounds that he ended up making the cut. 
So the next morning at 2.45 a.m., he got back on a plane, flew to Charlotte, North Carolina, on virtually no sleep, grabbed a rental car, drove straight to the course, hit the ball a few times, and went out on the course. Things didn't go so bad. And by the time the golf tournament had finished, the next day, he finished ninth and took home something like $229,000. Not bad for getting cut. Ended in the top 10. You see, people make that mistake in their lives. You look in the mirror, you go, I blew it. I screwed up. I ruined things. I'm not really a Christian. I ought to quit. Oh, forget that. You ought to just grab hold of Jesus. I don't deserve it. Of course you don't deserve it. The sooner you come to terms with that, the better off you'll be. I'm not good enough. That's why you need Jesus, because he is good enough. He's the only one who's good enough. And you grab him, and God looks at you and sees Jesus. There you go. Pretty simple. That's settled. You had a bad day. Hey, grab Jesus. Hang on to Jesus. Do it in sincerity. Don't do it in presumption. God will change your heart and grow your life and change your heart and grow your life. What did Jesus say in Mark 2 and verse 17? Oh, very interesting words. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you give up, what does that prove? You're just out the game. If every golfer who had a bad round quit, there'd be no golfers left. They'd all give it up. For the Christian, you got to know that Jesus doesn't give up on you. And Jesus will live his life in you. Rough day, hang on to Jesus. You stumbled again, learn from that. Learn from that. And hold on tight to Jesus and let him grow you. And believe that through faith in Christ... You have everlasting life. Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So where does that leave that, oh, well, what's wrong with? I'm going to heaven, so what's, no, you know, you don't ask those questions. Wouldn't this be okay? What's wrong with that? Isn't a little just okay? That's not Christianity, man. You don't do that in your marriage. Spouse says, don't fool around. You say, isn't a little okay? No, no, no fool around with that stuff this is God we're talking about you want him to have your whole heart you're going to believe you're going to read thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy all of thy heart soul mind and strength and over here you're going to say oh man isn't a little okay Uh, can't I just get away with Ah, let's resolve that you want Jesus to take all of your heart live his life in you and remake you you just want to surrender to Jesus not let someone else occupy the throne of your heart only Jesus not you Only Jesus, not the devil, trust in the Lord. Uh, Again, I I mentioned this earlier. I'll breeze over this a little more quickly. What we don't want to factor out about Christian experience is growth. Many people claim Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and then they stumble and they bumble and they bumble and they stumble. Like ah, forgetting that a redwood tree takes hundreds and hundreds of years to mature. Forgetting that Rome wasn't built in a day. Forgetting that things take time, even your spiritual growth. Your salvation doesn't take any time at all. That's a decision. But you look in the mirror and you see a sinner. Well, yeah, but you're growing. Just hang on to Jesus. Grow, grow, grow a little more. Keep reading the Bible. These people are like, well, I'm such a sinner. Do you read the Bible? No. What do you expect? I struggle with sin. Ah, Do you pray? Uh, Maybe for about a minute. You're going to keep struggling. So come, come into communion with God. Just take time. Sit down. Read that book, man. Oh, I struggle with Ezekiel. Turn over to John. Turn to Acts. Turn to Romans. Oh, I struggle with Romans 5. Go to Romans 6. You can't struggle with that. Go to Romans 8. Boom. It's like dynamite. And so we go to God in spite of our weaknesses, and we grow. I want you to see what Paul said, same author, When he wrote to the church in Rome, he said, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ. Consider yourself dead to sin. I should have put that in question time earlier. You got it? First thing, that sin. Believe that you're dead to it. That's really important. Then verse 16. Power, man. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or obedience under righteousness. We want to be holy. We want to be saved. We want to have the righteousness of Jesus. We claim it by faith. 
and we surrender. We yield. We yield. You, you, can't, you, you can't will the imperfections out of your life, the sin out of your life. You yield to God. He will drive them out. Prayer and fasting, good. We ought to do that. But the key is Christ and faith in Christ and surrender to Jesus Christ. Someone cuts you off in traffic, God's going to say, surrender. Ah, you surrender. And then it gets easier next time. Somebody backs into your car in a parking lot. You want to yell. No, you don't. Jesus, take my mouth. Take my, calm me down. I surrender to you. And now you can be like, ah, I'm glad you have insurance. We can get this taken care of. God makes your vocal cords a channel of blessing. That's what he does. Send a prayer to God. Peter did. He was sinking. What did he do? He cried out, Lord, save me. He was sinking. You start sinking. Hair on your neck starts rise. Veins start boom. Send out that prayer. Lord, save me. And he'll save you. That's what he does. You do it every time. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We looked at it earlier. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it just powerful we surrender sin attacks surrender whatever the battle might be surrender jesus brings his powerful presence and his righteousness into your life you surrender you 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 fail turn the page yield again turn the page yield again that's what growing is all about when you were a child and you were learning to walk you've spent more time on your derriere than on your feet did you come to the place where you said, oh, forget it, I just won't walk. I'll crawl for the rest of my life. No, 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 no. You fell, you got up. Let Jesus pick you up. You can't go a day without smoking. Go a minute. Just go a minute. And they go, well, can, can God enable me to go another minute and another minute? Can I do this leaning on Jesus? This is what happens. Jesus described the work of the gospel in a parable as being like seed that is sown. And it comes up first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Growth. Yield and grow. And believe that God gives you his righteousness because that is precisely what God does. Now we talk about heaven. Three heavens. There are three heavens. One, the Bible says, where the birds fly. That's the heavens. Birds fly in the heavens. Another heaven is where the stars are, space. That's referred to in the Bible as heaven. And the other, the other heaven is where God lives. Heaven, three heavens. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God's dwelling place. We're going to go to a physical place, an actual place, a real place. And we go there when Jesus comes back to take us there. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Powerful. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Jesus is coming back to be our tour guide and take us on a journey like you never had before. What a magnificent reunion. Children will see their parents again, grandparents again. Parents will see their children again. We'll see friends, family, acquaintances, former church members. We're going to see it all. Can you imagine those reunions? Death was, was, was never meant to be. You go to a graveyard, you see those little gravestones on teeny tiny graves, children born here. The parents are going to see their children again. Grandparents are going to see their grandchildren again. And parents are going to see their moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas again. It's, it's going to happen. And eternity stretches before us. We have heaven to enjoy forever. The, the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise. What a day. Jesus challenges our thinking in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. I mean, Paul wrote these words. As it's written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. Paul borrowed that from the prophet Isaiah who wrote those words in Isaiah chapter 64. Let's take a moment to imagine what heaven's going to be like. Can you imagine? It'll be better than that. 
What's your wildest dreams? Better than that. Most beautiful place you've been to? Better than that. New Zealand. Better than that. I mean, see how good it is. Better than that. It's got to be better. Better. You never get bored. You'll never wish you were somewhere else. You'll never be sitting there listening to the preacher thinking, I wish he would end. You never think that. Not in heaven. You never have that experience. You never have a dull moment. You'll always be fulfilled. You'll always be thrilled and blessed. Better than the best vacation. Better than your dream home. Better than the best place you've ever been. Uh, best of all, Jesus is there. You're in the presence of God. So it's not like you just go to some heavenly Hawaii. It, it's better than anything you could even dream because there you are with God himself. John wrote in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And immediately, he said, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. He saw God in Daniel 7. Daniel saw God, the ancient of days, whose hair was white as snow. The, uh, who, who, who's, I, I listened to, that this, listened to that this morning during my devotional time. The hair on his head were like the pure will. His, and anyway, I should be able to recite that and I just got stumbled. There's God, Daniel saw him, his clothing as white as snow, hair pure as wool, his throne like a fiery flame, wheels as burning fire, great multitudes in heaven, undoubtedly an amazing place. Would you want to be anywhere else? Would you want to compromise your ability to be there with God? Revelation eleven nineteen 19 says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. There was seen in his temple the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments inside, reminding us the relevance, the importance, the vitalness of the Ten Commandments. They're as important now as ever. What's Jesus doing? He's in heaven. What's he doing there? In Hebrews chapter 8. Some folks have been studying about this recently. Hebrews 8. Verse 1, there's the Ten Commandments, but we go to Hebrews now. We have such an high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. What's Jesus doing there? A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected. In heaven, you have a lawyer. His name is Jesus. He's an advocate. He's your mediator. See, see he says, I know you're going to blow it, so come to me, I'll take care of that. I know you're going to have problems, so come to me. I'll help you deal with that. That's what he says. Why wouldn't we come? God, help me. Take my heart. Yes, we're guilty when we show up at heaven's courtroom, except that we are declared righteousness as righteous as we have allowed Jesus to take our sins. This earth is heaven's focus. Can you imagine how vast this universe is? Every now and then, I, I saw a picture the other day taken from something out there. It was looking through or past the rings of Saturn, and in the distance you could see planet Earth, just this dot. The wow, it's a vast universe. God is focusing right now on what's happening here. He's focusing on you. You, you, you. We talk about loving God. Don't forget that God loves you. Don't forget that. You want to go to heaven? I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I think you do. But God wants you there more than you want you there. Who wants you saved more than anybody? God. That's why he sent Jesus to die for you. God offers you everlasting life. Thank the Lord that God offers you life and that there's somebody representing you in heaven. Now, we look beyond heaven. We talk about going to heaven, but what happens next? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Oh, this gets really exciting. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. In Revelation chapter 21, God says, God says, well, he does through John. John says, he saw the earth made new. You read in the book of Zechariah that when Jesus comes down, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. It splits wide open. It becomes a great plain for the holy city, the new Jerusalem, to rest on. The earth is going to be made new, and God will relocate the capital city of the universe to this earth, the scene of his greatest triumph. God sees you, and he sees in you the value of the life of Jesus. That Jesus is coming back to take you to be where he is. Heaven, God's place, 
God wants you to be there. Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 1. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God into the Lamb. In the middle of its street, either side of the river, was the tree of life. This is awesome. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And get this, he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is God's desire to dwell with his people. You know, I'm going home in a couple of days, and, and uh, I don't want you to think I, I'm already looking in the rearview mirror, but, but my point is what I know is that I'm going to dwell with my people. I'm going to be with my family. My wife will meet me at the airport. The next two people I see will be my kids, I hope. Hmm. Can't wait. That's how God feels about you being in his presence, but, but far more in Intently and intensely. God is going to dwell with us. He'll wipe away all tears from our eyes. There'll be no more death or sorrow or crying. There'll be no more pain because the former things are passed away. We struggle with tragedy and loss and death and mayhem and disaster and heartbreak on this earth. But one day we'll all be behind us. This earth is Satan's best effort. It's his final shot. Soon there'll be no more devil. Look in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 5. In eternity there'll be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. We'll build houses and inhabit them. It's going to be remarkable. We'll plant vineyards and eat their fruit. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 11 and verse 6, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie with the kid the baby goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little child shall lead them. Verse 19, he goes on to say, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How can you be there? Through Christ, believing by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Not by climbing Mount Everest, not by swimming the widest ocean, not by winning the Nobel Prize, not by getting your doctorate in astrophysics, but by faith in Jesus. Simple. I remember living in London, uh, being in London, England, living there for a summer. I lived there longer, but this was later. Met Michael. Michael lived next door to our friends, and Michael was a philosopher. He taught philosophy at a university in one of the great cities of the world, London. It was interesting, Michael had what would amount to a terminal disease at the time. I said to Michael, so what is it with philosophy, Michael? He said, we wrestle with the great questions. Questions such as what? Questions such as, why are we here? I said, Michael, you don't know why you're here? He said, well, no, it's one of the great pursuits of philosophy to understand and answer that question. Why are we here? I said to Michael, Michael, I think I can tell you. I think I know why we're here. God created us for eternity. The, the entire point of your life on earth is preparation for heaven, to be in the presence of God. To say to Jesus, you love me enough to die for me, you can have me. Here I am. To live with God at God's place, to be there in eternity. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you stopped wondering. You started believing. I have the gift of everlasting life. Does not mean I can't walk away from it. That's another story. But I possess it now. I have it by faith. I'm not turning back. I'm not turning away by the grace of God. Don't hope. Believe. Believe. Revelation 22 and verse 14 says, Blessed are they that keep his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gate into that city. Into that city. We can believe it. Follow me now. In the early 1960s, the Soviet cosmonaut traveled up into heaven. He said, he was reputed to have said, I flew up into the heavens and I did not see God. The only way you cannot see God is if you're not looking, for he's there. He will reveal himself. Young fellow I work with sends me these photos from time to time. He loves to look at space through telescopes and stuff. Sent me this amazing photograph he had taken. It was of this thing, and it had a thing around it. It was amazing. He told me what it was. I don't know. Something. And then he said to me, all the dots you see in the background, they're all galaxies. Amazing. 
What a vast universe. You see that, you see God. He made that. I'm looking at that. I'm saying, I don't know which direction heaven is from there, but one day I'm going up. I'm going through that. I want you to come with me. I'm going on and on and on and on. I guess I am going on, but we're going to go on through there. And we're not putting our feet down until they land on a sea of glass or maybe streets of gold. We are going to our father's house. The Egyptians, they built these great big pyramids. They said, oh, yeah, we're going to put our, our dead luminaries in there and we're going to equip them for the afterlife. They gave them flowers and food and chariots and this. No, we don't need that where we're going. We are going to our father's house. We'll be in heaven soon. When Jesus comes back, the eastern sky splits wide open. Christ comes riding down the corridors of space. Gravity won't hold you down anymore. Up we go. Weightlessness. And on to glory. There's a place for you. There's a place for you in God's heart. There's a place for you in God's home. There's a mansion that God would just love to go to right now. Put your name on the front door. He'd love to do that. Why can't he? The only reason he wouldn't is if you say, don't do that. Don't do that. It's not a myth. It's more, it's, I think this world is a myth. The reality is heaven. That's the reality. What a place. If you can have faith, that, do you want to go? If you can have faith in Jesus, heaven is yours. God says, I'll take you. Whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. God bought your ticket already. When Jesus died on the cross, your passage to heaven was made sure. You just got to want to go. What a day. What a day that's going to be. What a day. When Jesus, Jesus comes back. Listen, the problem with the world is it distracts us. We forget. Oh, man, my heart is strangely warmed. We're talking about the Bible. Oh, I want to go to heaven. Oh, I leave here. and Oh, what's in the news? And oh, Important stuff. I've got to go to work on Monday. I've got to get ready for that. Oh, what are we doing? heaven fades into the background. Tennessee Williams, the fellow who wrote A Streetcar Named Desire, wrote a little story, and it was called Something by Tolstoy. In that story, there's a fellow named Jacob. Jacob owns a bookstore. He's married to Lila. They're so, I mean, they're happy. But Lila's an artist, well, a musician, and she really wants to have a shot at the big time. And one day, someone says to her, would you travel with us? Go on the road, sing. It'll be a big deal. Lila said, I'm going. Jacob, I'm going, but I'll be back. And Jacob said, <sighs> he gave her a key. He said, this is the key to the front door. When you come back, just let yourself in. Tell me you're here. I can't wait for you to come back. Jacob was bookish in the story. Red, 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 like a crazy man. The days turned into weeks, into months. And into years. And he felt like maybe Lila would never come back. And he just immersed himself in his own world. And one day, a key was put on the front door and the lock was turned. And a young lady, not nearly as young now, let herself in. Jacob thought it was a customer. He came out. He said, can I help you? She said, Jacob. He said, yes. Are you here for a book? She said, Jacob, what can I find you? Is there a book I can get you? She said, yes, there's a book. It's about a young couple who were married. They moved into a bookstore. His name was Jacob. Her name was Lila. She went away. He gave her a key. She came back to walk back into his life. He looked, rubbed his chin. He said, sounds like something by Tolstoy. Let me see. He went to look for the book and she realized he just moved on he never even recognized her she left the store and never came back and Jacob was none the wiser you know what happened right there was distance and that distance was allowed to grow was allowed to get bigger bigger broader until forgetfulness had set in someone moved on Jesus died on the cross stretched out his arms they laid his body down he I think he positioned his hands just for them. They nailed nails through his hands, through his feet. Ah. They picked up the cross. Have you ever thought about what it felt like when they picked up the cross and dumped it in the hole? Ah. He was held to that thing by nails. The wounds must have got bigger. 
Jesus has never forgot that day. How can he? The Bible says that your name is engraved on a palm of his hands. Don't forget. Don't forget the love of God. Don't forget. Can you do something for me? Can you stand up wherever you are? It's everybody, just stand. Unless, of course, you have some medical reason why not to, then stay seated. But if you can stand, stand. You would welcome the stretch, I'm sure. But you wouldn't forget, would you? You wouldn't forget, would you? You wouldn't forget what Jesus has done for you. You wouldn't forget what God has promised you, would you? Would you? Now, some people arrived here today and they're like, me and Jesus, we're together. Others arrived thinking, I'm not sure who Jesus is. And others arrived somewhere in the middle. If you ask them, you go to heaven one day, they'd say, oh, no. You don't need to leave here today saying, oh, no. You can leave this place today saying, yes, because my faith is in Jesus. So I'd like to speak to your heart and ask you if today you would give your heart to Jesus. If you don't, that's between you and God. But if you do, there'll be rejoicing in heaven and rejoicing in your heart. It may be, it may be that God has been speaking to you about being baptized or rebaptized. It may be, may, maybe not. Maybe you're just a long, long, long way from God you'd like to come back or too far from God. I don't mean this in a general way. If you arrive today and things are pretty good between you and Jesus, then I'm welcoming you to stay where you are. But if they're not, I want to invite you to come forward and commit your life to Jesus or recommit your life to Jesus. If God is calling you to give him your heart, if you'd like to become a Christian, believe in Jesus, claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then please don't wait where you are. But come and join me right down here in the front and we'll pray together and we'll commit you to Jesus. If you've wandered far from God and it's time to come back, then it's time to come back. You can do that now. Don't wait. Marion's going to sing as she does. Come to Jesus, please, just as you are. Don't wait. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. very often so this is what's happening God is appealing to hearts here and he might be appealing to yours and you could leave here today saying everything is, is just like it was when I arrived or you can't you might say maybe I need to do something about my relationship with Jesus again I'm not just talking about oh you want to recommit your life to Jesus in a very general sense there's something in your heart it's got to go you're far from God you need to be close to God you, 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 you've never given your life to Jesus or God's been calling you be baptized be rebaptized. you'll be keeping God at arm's length it's God speaking to your heart through this broken instrument today and he's appealing to you and inviting you to come if you're standing there I want you to, to multitask stand and pray Pray for the ones near you. Pray for that person that maybe, maybe, you, maybe that person should go. Go to that person and invite to bring them. But as God calls you, I invite you today to come to Jesus. Don't wait. Just as I am and waiting not to read my soul of one dark blot to in a minute but I'm going to wait I have no uh, special powers of insight or discernment but I feel in my heart that God bless you maybe that's what I was feeling in my heart I feel in my heart that somebody else is going to come down in front today you don't have to kneel you can stand don't be worried about that do whatever you want but if Christ is calling you listen if you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never taken Jesus seriously and it's time to, if in your Christian experience you've been somewhat half-hearted but you want to be whole-hearted, be, be honest, has Jesus had your whole heart until this time? If he has, thank God. If he hasn't, you can do something about that right now and surrender to him now. So I'm inviting you, God is inviting you today to pray, 
pray for others, maybe pray for you. But if the Lord is calling you to come and declare that He is yours and that you are a Christian, you want to grow in your faith. For some, not all, for some it'll be, I need to be baptized or rebaptized. If that's you, I invite you to come too. So listen, if it's time for you to give your life to Jesus or to be baptized or to come back to faith in Jesus because you've wandered or to give Him your heart fully for the first time, as Marion sings, God is inviting you not to wait, but come to Jesus today. Do come. Don't tarry. Just as I am, thy love. pray you can come to Christ even while we pray we'll pray with you pastor West will come and join you pastor Billy is going to be here and talk with you and see if you have any questions that he can answer any any spiritual needs any desires we're just going to talk with you and find out where you're at but for now we want to pray join me in praying please our father in heaven we're thankful that you've opened the door of heaven and invited your own children to step through we thank you We are grateful today for Jesus, for the reality of heaven, the reality of heaven, and for your call on us to yield fully, to take faith seriously, to be connected with Jesus now and forever. Listen, friend, there's still time to come, even from the back row. I'll pray long enough. For you to make it here from the back. We thank you, Lord, that you would call to us. We are grateful that one day we get now to here. We are thanking you today for the reality of heaven above and for the reality of an earth that one day will be made new. We thank you that this power in your word, let your spirit speak to our hearts and bring conviction to bind up our wounds, to heal our broken hearts. And we thank you, dear Lord. You blessed us today. We've seen people unite their lives with you. We celebrate. We're grateful for each one of these who've come to Jesus today. We ask your blessing now. Keep them. Keep us all. Unite us with you, with your family, with your great heart of love. That on that day when Jesus returns, we will travel through the cosmos to be with him forever. Keep us, Father, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen, amen. Please be seated. Would you do that if you're there? Pastors, if you'd speak to our friends who've come forward, thank you very much. I think you have a card. Um, I'll remind you. No, you can can give me that back if you like. Or was it a battery? Thank you very much. Uh, If you you didn't get our our gifts from it as written, we want you to get them. Uh, We do. And I want to remind you of a couple of things. Tonight at 6, we have a concert. And uh, I hope you'll be back. Now, it may be that you have a better offer. You could be dining with the queen. Um, I don't know. But if you don't have a better offer, hope you'll be back here at 6 o'clock. Scott Michael Bennett and Marion Peppers will both be ministering in music. It'll be heavenly. Hope you'll be here. Uh, oh, by the way, this is an ending. We have a special uh, presentation in just a second. I'm just giving everybody time to get their ducks in a row. Uh, And then tonight, 7 o'clock, I share my testimony, the man God tried to kill. I'll have a good time, and I think you'll be blessed if you can make it. Pastor, are you coming forward? Grab a microphone. Thank you for allowing the pastor a moment more of your time. It would be inappropriate for you to walk out right now. So hold tight for just a second.